How are you all? How are you, Dave? Not that good. I'm pretty tired, I'll tell you that. I'm pretty tired. Yesterday, was it yesterday we talked about the Johns Hopkins project, or was that the day before? That was yesterday. What did you think of that? Yeah. Now, isn't it interesting how uh, something which on the surface would not s sound like it would reward attention, if you just stay with it a little bit and identify the, the principles of association between your experience and that, that uh, uh, th that's why it, it, it's always worthwhile to uh, try and figure out what the first cousin of the idea you have is, uh, e even if you wind up uh, deciding, you know, I don't even know how I got that idea. That's a stupid idea. Stay, you know, turn it around sometimes. And uh, here's a degenerate. It's Harv. Look, Mark, it's Harv behind you. Hey, Harv. You want to hear a funny story, Dayton? Dayton, hey Dayton, can I tell this story? It's a sweet story. Uh, it's not a, but it is, isn't about Dayton. Um, he, we were talking about, you know, I told us a little bit of a story about my family yesterday, and uh, so he was saying, Dayton was saying that when his dad was on his deathbed, it, sh it shows you how, you know. Uh, what looks to be one sort of gesture on the surface, deep down winds up meaning exactly the opposite. That his dad, uh, who was a gruff individual, he gives him, he gives him his betting system on the horses. As <laughs> that's his final living act. <laughs> and, and, and then he says, but don't give it to your fucking brother. <laughs> and uh, the uh, the laughter that comes uh, is the cousin of of uh, our initial reaction to that. And uh, if you follow out what the what the source of the laughter is. Um, remember, uh, you heard me say, and uh, you may be familiar enough with this uh, that we don't have to go into it in the detail, you know. But that uh, that uh, laughter is the release of fear at the thing survived. So, uh, like if in a cartoon, you know. Uh, the little guy's walking down the street and a safe hits him in the, in the noggin and he staggers away. You know, you laugh at the dichotomy between the expected consequence of the thing depicted and, the, and, and what the cartoon is showing. So, uh, uh, the divine comedy in that context is uh, what sin survived, uh, all of human experience transcended. And uh, in this case, uh, and, and you know, if, uh, if you ever look at people's faces when they see a newborn, you know, or when they see a little dog or, or something and it's trotting around, and they get, you know, this doofus grin on their face. And the doofus grin is informed by all that we now know of life. And that this living thing does not know. All that the sadness and sorrow and sense of separateness that we have and this little living thing doesn't know it and is happy and we're glad. The gladness is 
what makes us smile, the sense of, of our isolation and sadness and sorrow and separateness has been survived by the stimulus in the present moment. Another version of that little baby is a man's dying words when he says, but don't tell your fucking brother because what makes us laugh is even at that moment of extremity, the pettiness of life goes on and yet we are still recognizably human and cohabiting with that pettiness is a gesture of love that in the same gesture that that reaches out to Dayton and you know he his dad could, didn't have anything to give him except this for cock the betting system you know and probably the biggest favor his dad ever did Dayton's brother is by Dayton not giving him the betting system uh, pardon yeah <laughs> Um, but, but, uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you another, uh, story on, on my family that, that may make you smile a little bit, although it probably won't make you smile, but it, but it is still comic. Uh, uh quite clearly, you know, my, uh, you, you're able to infer from, uh, several other stories I, I've told you about my dad. You know, he was an enormously conflicted guy and uh, uh, troubled, and 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 uh, and uh, I know, nonetheless, uh, you know that he he loved me. He loved my brother and my mother. Um, but the interpretation of certain behaviors as love is sometimes more the translation's a little more difficult than others and uh, sometimes one is grateful uh, you know for things which are uh, not so difficult to translate and uh, uh, I was leaving home once for for whatever nefarious and confounded purpose and uh, uh, he had, uh, we'd had a big beef the night before, and uh, I was, uh, I guess from the time I was like eight or nine, I started, uh, I was a big Freon sniffer. I was a great slitter of refrigerator linings, you know, and, uh, and uh, then when I, uh, you know, my dad had a whole array of pharmaceuticals, and uh, I would try and take one of each by four o'clock every day, uh, without realizing that a lot of them, you know, acted against each other. So it, it, you didn't know what you, you knew you were fucked up, but you didn't know, you know, you were down, you weren't up, you were just bang. Uh And once I could get those equalized. Then I'd get in the bus and go out to the racetrack with no money at night. And that's one version of, of a day. Anyways, uh, so I was about to split. And uh, uh, the reason I, I tell you about all those medications is so in the morning, you know, it was kind of hard for me to tell when I was actually awake. You know, uh, am I awake? Am I dreaming that I'm awake? Am I because all the different medications, you know. Uh, but I heard my dad, I thought I heard my dad tip, tip, oh wait, before I tell you that story, I'll tell you another funny story about being so loaded that you can't figure out what's happening. Also in this bedroom, I had a friend, uh, Stump, the flying wedge, he was about five feet tall, maybe a little more, like five foot four, something like that. And, uh, and it, the stump uh, was a serious alcoholic, too. We lost him quite early on in the proceedings. But, uh, uh, oh, wait, I'll tell you another story about the stump first. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this was a story, actually. This story, I think, was in, like, uh, when we were, like, in 
you know, like eighth grade or whatever it was. But we, we were shit-faced. And he, 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 uh, he lived in Canada. And he was so shit-faced that, you know, I said, uh, uh, you know, Stumpy, do, uh, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it back there. I don't know how you're going to get on the bus or whatever the hell it was. And uh, so he so he stays he stays in the house. He stays in our house. We, we live in Buffalo on the United States side. And you know when you're so drunk, you just you keep your foot on the floor, just to, there there there. I I heard that. Yeah, just con trying to control a spin, you know. And you, oh, just if I throw up, don't let me throw up on myself. And. Uh, so now, I don't know if I'm awake or asleep, I hear, boom, I hear, I don't know what it is I hear, but it's something hitting the floor in the room. And then, it, oh, it's the flying wedge. He fell out of bed. You know. So I, well, that's not the worst thing in the world. Then he, I hear these footsteps. That's what made me think of it, of my dad, footsteps. So I hear these footsteps, and I think, uh, oh, the flying wedge is going to the can. Well, that's a good gesture towards hygiene, you know. Uh, now I'm thinking, wait a second. I, I heard the tippy toe of the flying wedge going this way, and the John is over here. What is the flying wedge up to? The flying wedge don't realize where he is. The flying wedge thinks he's at home in Canada. Where is the John and the Flying Wedge's house in Canada? My parents' fucking bedroom. I'm up. I go into my parents' bedroom. There is the Flying Wedge taking a horrific dump on my parents' bedroom floor. And my, I see the two, these two figures. <laughs> ah. And, uh, you know, the collective denial systems are bombed. Dad, how are you? You know, I dragged the flying wedge out. I come back. This, I, I'll explain this to you another time. You know, I told the flying wedge the next morning, and he dove right out the second story window. He wouldn't even, <laughs> he wouldn't even go downstairs. <laughs> so, now I won't tell you the other flying wedge story. So, anyways, I hear, I hear uh, my dad in the morning, and I can't figure out... Uh, uh, you know, am I asleep? Am I awake? I hear his footsteps, and then, and because uh, he knew I was leaving, and he he went and he just patted my hair, but he he, he didn't do it enough to wake me up, because he was shy about that stuff, you know, but he was saying goodbye, and in the yearnings of the heart, you know. The discrepancy between that and what would be interpreted as a normal gesture of affection, uh, that can make you smile too, because that's in that discrepancy is the thing survived. That uh, the wounded heart uh, is able to interpret and, and transcend that, to, to know that that is a gesture of love. And w one of the uh, you know, one of the things I was saying to you yesterday about art, you know, this is the process by which the pain of the past and its pastness is uh, transmuted to the future tense of joy. And um, the, the, the doubleness that the artist experiences, you know, standing outside and figure, uh, that's why, you know, I say try and always stay with whatever association you have until you see its first cousin because maybe your in unconscious, your imagination is trying to tell you something that maybe your consciousness is afraid for you, is reluctant for you to indwell with, but that in fact is a thing survived that can be the material of art which you can transmute from pain in, into joy. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Um, see, now, 
because I don't have a, any particular state in objective reality, I see you as a creature with a camera for a head. And you know, it, it ain't, a, it's, it's kind of a lateral move. It's not a trip. Um, we're a long time friends. And this guy first presented himself to me as a relative, and I'm not entirely sure he is. Uh, okay, so now, what, what, what do you want to follow out uh, as a process of, of, you know, tracking down first cousins? Do you want to, do you want to stay with the, the idea from yesterday? Do you want to, somebody want to say, you know, just take a venue as the premise for a series, just volunteer one and we can try and improvise and, and uh, uh, you know, and extrapolate a world. Have you discussed how your father wounded you? You've discussed that you were wounded. I haven't, I missed one session, so maybe I missed part of it. <laughs> Is that the question that I just asked? Well, I told you, I, did I, were you here for the story where, you know, he took me out the track when I was five? You know, it says, now you're set up to bet. Max, the waiter, will run your fucking bets for you. But do not let me see you fucking sneaking out here on your own. Were you here for that one? Well, go get the tape then. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a bit of a departure from the norm, isn't it? Uh, and, and uh, anyways. Uh, are you going to suggest or are you going to look for me to smile with my reinforcement? Did it sound like I was inviting him to pursue his question? It might, it might be my style or it might be your reluctance. Then let's go. I'm working on a, a project around a, um, a team that I was part of. It's called the uh, Crisis Response Team. And uh, we're the only unit that's allowed on the scene of a, we're the only civilians allowed on crime scene. And what we do is the job that the- Can everybody hear? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm working on a, a project connected with a, um, a police unit that I was a part of. It's a civilian unit. It's the only civilian unit allowed on, um, on murder scene. And uh, some police are still reluctant to have us there, but- Imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But they get kind of used to us, and what we do is we comfort and provide help for the living victims. Like, you know, if there's a mother and her son has died, we may, like, you know, help take care of the kids, anything from that to even cleaning up the blood and the brains on the sidewalk so the family doesn't have to walk in. And the police start to like us over time because we do the job that they don't want to do so they can concentrate on the solving the crime. And in cases here and there, we'll hear about things that may be related to the crime, but we're there for the victim, primarily. Uh, and where is this? Where does it take place? Uh, in Boston. And uh, how, how long has the unit been in existence? Um, the unit evolves. It's been in existence about 12 years, but it was originally started by, um, by missionaries and priests. And then as it expanded throughout the city, people who became interested in, um, in helping out just join. They don't have to be of any particular religion. So, uh, so, so have you heard that? This is a, a, a civilian team that uh, tries to help families or the victims, uh, 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 the collateral uh, victims of a crime. They, and we're usually only there until the body's taken away or until we can help the family or find relatives if they're kids. Um, and uh, do, do you want to leave it there? Do you want to tell us a little more about how you've tried to develop the series? Or would you rather we well, just... We to a team of people and like um, the different people in the real unit, they all come from different backgrounds and they merge <coughs> just for, for that particular case. And it's about really how they, certain people end up getting more involved in helping to solve the crime. Okay. Now, uh, um, the, uh, in the genesis of the team, uh, traditionally, uh, people feel that cops don't understand. Civilians 
uh, there's a disposition to feel that that uh, cops are there, for example, just to solve the crime, and they don't care about the collateral victims, right? Was there any history of uh, that this was that this was uh, predominantly in black communities? Uh, the reason I ask is Boston has a history of real racial tension. No, when I signed up for it, I wasn't living in a black community. I switched my uh, beeper so I could get more calls from the black community because there was more crime, and you know I wanted more action. And so, uh, but but was this response team? particularly active in the black community? Uh, I don't know. When I joined it, it was, it was throughout the city. Well, but if you say, I wanted more action, that would suggest that there was more action in the black yeah, community. Yeah, there was more action in the black community. Right. And uh, so the, in, in terms of uh, associating one idea with another idea, the initial premise is a crisis response team. Now, in the process of trying to begin to bring the premise alive in the imagination, I'm trying to ask leading questions which would begin to flesh out the dynamics of the premise. So one of the dynamics would be uh, the impulse in those who have suffered the trauma of uh, loss, violence, violation to attempt to understand the experience by binding it to less traumatic but more familiar ways of explaining their relationship to outside forces which control them. Uh, the victim of, let's say, uh, a burglary which turned into a murder uh, feels absolutely at a loss. Uh, in ter it, it, every discipline, w uh, you know, every structure w which he or she has used to make himself feel at home ha has, has been broken. Um, now, in comes a stranger. And the impulse is to associate, and in fact, it's a way of grieving, which is a way of beginning to survive the experience, is to say to the cop, oh, what are you, are you going to rob me too? You're going to wait till my back is turned and then steal what hasn't been stolen yet? Or you don't know what the fuck happened, and you're never going to know what, it ha what happened because you're not black. Um, that is, in fact, and what, a, what a, a cop understands is that that is a way of beginning to grieve. It's a way of identifying with another human being and saying, you can't understand the experience I've just gone through, except instead of talking about the horrible experience which has just taken place, for which th th there is no prior uh, uh, grid of understanding to superimpose, you dislocate it and put it on the cop. Now, the danger that a cop would feel in relation to a civilian crisis team is, well, here come the do-gooders that don't understand fuck all about the way that the victims of crime live into the aftermath of crime, which is by blaming us, and we have to kind of let them do that because it's what disposes them to feel protected enough by yelling at us to begin to share information about what the crime scene was like. Um, the now uh, simultaneously, so so that's the ideal cop. Then there are cops who understand the, that dynamic that people want to grieve, but they don't like black people. 
so in the rippling out of events in the aftermath of a tragedy, you may hear a cop say, uh, not for nothing, I didn't break into your fucking house. So let's go a little easy on the bullshit, and why don't you tell me what the fuck happened? Now, paradoxically, in another context, you've heard of the dynamic uh, good cop, bad cop. A lot of times, an apparently unfeeling personality is easier for the victim to relate to in the immediate aftermath of crime. Uh, what I'm, what I'm uh, trying to suggest is that the, the, the surface impulse of coming to aid, civilians coming to aid, to the extent that any new variable enters an equation, the whole equation changes. And what many cops are going to say is, I got a better idea. Why don't you run a bingo game? Because we're trying to solve crimes here. Now, to some extent, that is a kind of alcoholic response. And a lot of cops are, are, are alcoholics. Because anything that's new, a cop is disposed to say, it's fucked. It's no good. It ain't going to work. Uh, when I was writing uh, NYPD Blue and, and uh, the original star left, and the network said, we're done. We're f it took us all this time to get a fucking hit show, and now this self-involved Dago goes to be a movie star. <laughs> and and uh, so, so what I did was to, to try and portray in his partner a a characteristic alcoholic's response to any disruption in his routine. Because finally, what an alcoholic is, I want to know where my booze is at all times, and I want an unobstructed path to it. <laughs> and and if, if I do the same thing every day, I can work out what time I'm going to be able to sneak into the drawer and get the thing. But if I got a new person here who's looking at my fucking drawer, that ain't going to work. So, and the seemingly inexplicable irritability of the alcoholic is always, always to that the anticipation of change as a dis because what the, the drug wants you to believe is, don't let me get low, Rich. You know, do you remember the Richard Pryor routine where he's talking about the crack? But hey, let me get a little low there, Rich. Don't. don't. Um, so, in in portray in in now. The whole goal of getting viewer allegiance to the premise of a show is to addict the viewer to the premise. Now here's a disruption of the premise. Now how, what you then want to do is to provide a surrogate for the viewer's sense of disruption, which distracts the viewer from the disruption and simultaneously provides him with a means of saying, oh, I can survive this. I, I, the thing survived is comedic. So I can get over this. So what I did was exaggerate the viewer's own sense of dislocation so that the new character comes in. He says, hi, I'm Bobby Simone. So he says, yeah, yeah, how you doing? Excuse me, just a second. He goes into the boss. He says, that ain't going to work. <laughs> that ain't going to work. And the boss says, what, what happened? What happened? What happened? Oh, how you doing? This type of thing. That, that ain't going to work. <laughs> and what the audience is, is now distracted by, it's away from the newness of Simone and back to the familiarity of this fucking Andy. He can't adjust to anything. He can't adjust to a guy saying hello. The corollary of which for the viewer is give him a fucking break. Give the new guy a fucking break. And a rebind, rebonding to the premise of the material. Now, in this case, in your series, uh, the the uh, 
when I hear, you know, a premise about a crisis team, which comes in, cleans up, and splits, I think dilettantes. Uh, because there's some uh, consequences of that crisis that can't be cleared up, cleaned up. Um, now, the way to get your viewer to give your series a chance is to have someone exaggerate the viewer's own resistance, which is a figure that the viewer typically associates as with as his surrogate for dealing with crisis, a cop. So now what you have a cop is, what you have a cop doing is being even more f unfair to the crisis team than the viewer is. And the viewer ain't that thrilled. You know, oh, a crisis team. Jeez, that sounds great. I'll get, a, I'll, I'll get to watch a mop up every fucking week. Uh, but if you have a cop saying, give me, give me, you know, just when I think this job cannot get more fucked up, they send in another kind of bureaucrat. Isn't that wonderful? What happened? Did someone uh, drive over your lawn when you were a child and you're trying to work it out? Uh, so now what the audience is, well, that's a little rough. You know, and uh, uh, and then if he's an Irish cop, you know, maybe he's saying, "Let me ask you a question: uh, Are there any white crisis teams that I might be able to work with? Not for nothing, you know, but uh, I might be more inclined." Or he wouldn't say that to the to 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 the the crisis worker, but he but he says to a partner, you know, he, he says. I win the lottery. It's not enough that we got a crisis team assigned to us, but we got five Moulinyams in the crisis team. Who did I offend in heaven? So you see how uh, by, by trying to build in to the premise, uh, uh, you know, uh, I tried to explain uh, the other day how in the course of trying to explain fancy, I, I tried to give you an emotional experience of what it means to be fanciful as opposed to imaginative, that you're only capable of identifying with certain stimuli at the cost of a fuller appreciation of the humanity of, 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 of the recollection and that the job of the expanding premise is to accommodate what is fanciful and gradually uh, uh, turn it into an imaginative connection. So if, if, uh, uh, if this cop is confiding to his partner and what he's saying, it's, I, 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 I don't know what fucking lottery I lost that I keep, and if the the uh, the black crisis worker is talking to a friend of hers and says, just loud enough for the cop to hear, it, it, is, are there any police teams that aren't composed of donkey fucking mix that we could get assigned to? <laughs> just to give us half a shot because I know this isn't going to work, but what I'm trying to do in my survey is figure out whether it's possible that it could work. And as, as, as long as we get, you know, the guys with the busted capillaries <laughs> wondering where the, where the nearest bar is, we, we don't know whether it's because they're assholes or whether this is a bad idea. You say, excuse me, who are you talking to, says the cop. Is this something the whole class can appreciate? Now. You see how it widens out a little? Um, the idea of who gets more involved, you know, is one that I would re-examine. Uh, or at least 
you want to probably re-encounter the terms of why it it, it 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 certainly oughtn't to be on the basis of moral excellence. You know, who gets more involved with these cases? Who goes back to to see how they're doing? Uh, typically, the people who go back uh, are people who need to go back for their own purposes. And what you, in order to examine that syndrome, what you probably want to have is a victim who says, or a cop who is trying to follow up and get the victim to remember what the person looked like. And what the cop can say to the crisis, remember the crisis team is, look, whatever, whoever it was, you know, that stole your lawnmower, you know, or spoke to you harshly at the mall or whatever the fuck it was, we're, we're, we're trying to get an ID from this woman, okay? And then if somehow the woman finds it in herself, and, and, and typically, you know, an Irish guy, it, when he's talking to a woman, say, who's been a victim of a rape, and a black woman, you know, he can't even look at her, you know, because he's so uncomfortable. Uh, because uh, he, he, you know, sex is a, is, is a charged issue for him. Uh, race is a charged issue, and so typically, in order to accommodate his discomfort, he will assume that the victim is promiscuous. So he says, well, like, uh, was that the first guy you'd had sex with today? Or how many guys, how many guys had you had sex with <laughs> before he raped you? Like, like that, you know? And uh, obviously that's an extreme version of it. But if the victim is able, is grateful that the, crisis member is come back he says, uh, and she says I'd rather talk to her he says, oh geez break my heart break my heart oh please you want to talk to her instead of me I'll be at the alibi room this is the number of the pay phone give me a call when you got all the information see and then if she shows up at the alibi room with the information and he and they wind up befriending each other and if it turns out she can drink a little bit this girl <laughs> now you may have the basis for a friendship Okay? You're welcome. Who else? Isn't the series over if they become friends? Yeah, it's completely over. <laughs> Schmuck. <laughs> What's implied by your question? That you have to just reside at the surface, uh, at, the, at the threshold level, and that the audience isn't going to be willing to go with you into the complications. So if the premise you laid out is is all these like social and, and personal conflicts that are going on. Uh, I once heard you say that the trick in TV is to do the same thing week to week and make it look different. And if if, if they become friends, then you lose that all, all those dynamics. Maybe maybe the, the what I meant by the trick in in TV doing the same thing. And make it look different. You you heard me say, I hope you heard me say in previous conversations that the same thing, to the extent that one is resting transparently in the spirit which gave us rise, the same thing is every form of experience. And to recognize that things which look different, essentially, are the same, allows you to do anything at all uh, so so this uh, uh, the black woman is in there drinking with the cop and she experiences pain and it turns out she has sickle cell trait or something that it's impossible for the cop to have uh, yet his compassion uh, 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 she's shown that she's got a little something going on now he tries to find an equivalent that nonetheless acknowledges difference. I, 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 had, a, I had an aunt, a fucking diabetic. Of course, she's a diabetic. She fucking drank and she smoked, you know. And she, 
what a pain in the balls she was. He's trying to identify. And this woman, to the extent that she was brave enough to reach out to come into the bar and is drinking, that means she's a little bit lonely, you know. And she says, I, I, I had an uncle like that, diabetic, smoked a lot. And he, he, he kept drinking, and he went blind. Oh, geez, well, you went me one better. Congratulations. Well, now, now you're seeing that there that the, the, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's people reaching out, but it looks different because you're complicating it, you know. Now, this is a story of a man who believes he's a camera. There was such a movie, I Am a Camera. Oh, didn't, pardon? But wasn't that, the, yeah, I mean, that was the basis for, I think, Christopher Isherwood. Those were the Berlin stories. Another degenerate. Now, you know, Christopher Isherwood and W.H. Auden were very close friends. And I am the author of the shortest memorial poem occasioned by the death of W.H. Auden. Shall I recite it to you? He sure looked a lot like Lillian Hellman. <laughs> 